lots of legal and corporate acquisition news this week. Qualcomm and Broadcamp, Qualcomm and Broadcom just can't seem to find that love connection. Google and T-Mobile face separate lawsuits, and you might be in line for a rebate if you replaced your iPhone battery at full price. We've got a lot to talk about, so make sure you're charged and ready for episode 291 of the Pocket Now Weekly. Recorded February 9th at noon Pacific time, this weekly podcast is where we dissect and discuss those gadgets that make our lives mobile. Smartphones, tablets, and wearables. It's all the stuff you wished existed when you were a kid, and buying music CDs was the coolest thing ever, and those are apparently going the way of the dodo. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, senior editor at Pocketnow.com, joined as always by plucky podcast producer Mr. Jules Wong out on the East Coast. How's it going, buddy boy? Yeah, to be honest, I'm a little tired today. It's a it's a gray day of a Friday, so uh, uh, and the mood isn't up to speed as uh, I would like it to be. I haven't had coffee today, and it's wow, just dude. sleepy, dude. Sleepy. Dude, I like I I would happily share some of our eighty plus degree <laughs> sunshine and weather here in the Southwest. I mean, I don't even need eighty plus degrees. I just need sunshine. I mean, I got this artificial thing going on here. It's, it's you got, just... you know, that seasonal affected. Yeah, because, you know, we're all actually the fact is it's 80 degrees in Los Angeles feels really nice. But that makes us crazy nervous about what, you know, the warmer seasons are going to be like. And especially for those of us out in the valley, we're going to get nuked come August. So not looking forward to that. I can't wait to see you fry. <laughs> right. It's going to be uh, some gadget guy on a hot tin roof. It's going to be sizzling so like crazy. Some bacon guy, bacon. Right, I'm gonna have to change guy. the whole show. I'm gonna look like, uh, like uh, some really crazy midlife crisisy dude driving a convertible. He's way too tan. No, some uh, crazy midlife crisisy guy. That see, you know the the uh, the moniker works. It works really well. It's just kind of branding. Keep man. You gotta keep it. You know, keep your on brand uh, persona in check. And, and what's completely on brand is uh, us moving from our general top of show banter to uh, start digging into the hottest news stories of the week as published on pocketnow.com as shared by people online joining the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag <laughs> PN Weekly. And uh, definitely, uh, if you're offline, if you're not watching us live, uh, hit up our email address, podcast at pocketnow.com. We're going to have our favorite picks the end of this month, we promise. Uh, it was we're going to try and get back into our viewer mailbag, uh, viewer take the wheel shows on a monthly basis. I like how you segued, you, you pulled up all the, the information that you could there. You, you kind of, you were almost going to jump in and then you realized, oh, we have to talk about the socials. We have to do that, some that admin going in. Very well may have been the absolute best segue I've ever pulled off in the history of the show. I just want I that mean, to be right? right there on one of, uh, like not the most exciting news weeks, considering we're all kind of getting our pre pros ready for uh, MWC uh, and uh, Samsung just, blowing up. You know, we're we're, we're, we're in the weeks. gulch. We're we're between the cliffs here, and yeah. we're just traveling down the the riverbed. And uh, the now we're just trying to make the our storm. Way. The season before yeah, harvest. Indeed. It's uh, we're we're uh, we're still here though, because we want to have this conversation with you fine folks out there. And there are actually some pretty interesting things to talk about. It's just, you know, it's yeah. not gonna get off like exactly one really hot new. We're gonna pretend now. that this is gonna be more exciting and I'm gonna like put on my radio voice or whatever. <laughs> For the week of February 5th, 2018, this is all the news that has fit podcast. Let's start off with uh, Qualcomm, which has rejected Broadcom's revised uh, acquisition offer of $121 billion. That's over the magic $80 per share mark that some stockholders see, but directors have sent a letter to Broadcom CEO Hawk Tan to negotiate a true highest offer for the company, leading to some concerns with tech analysts that if uh, innovations are up for sale, to a conservative money-making regime, but Hawk Tan himself is a pretty harsh negotiator. He has not paid more than 6% above his initial offer for any of the recent acquisition, acquisitions that he has uh, made. 
Google has a few class action lawsuits going up. One of them focuses on the hardware audio uh, issues that it failed to properly support and address on the Pixel and original uh, Pixel XL. Uh, another concerns its carrier project, Phi, where the complaint being billed for public Wi-Fi access, which is part of the conceit for the network switching between uh, 4G, 3G, and Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi been sued by a victim of a part out scam prior to telling consumers about a new measure to protect themselves from being switched to another carrier. Suddenly and forcefully, the man claims that the uncarrier failed to provide adequate account security, which led ultimately led to him losing thousands of dollars in cryptocurrency. Wiley Fox, a British, uh, British phone OEM that has invested in Cyanogen and Windows phone devices, has entered into administration and could be looking at complete dissolution soon, tearing robotic industries, which has long tried to deliver on the world's first phone with liquid morphium, is also going through bankruptcy, though it says that the process is for settling of rent disputes, and uh, th th those will be interesting to watch. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, we mourn for any loss of competition in the space, especially with the more marginal players. The marginal it's it's just we're we're coming to a point where uh, things are just uh, you know it's the main competitions here it stays and uh, it pretty much knocks any other uh, player out of the race. That's it. So, okay. I mean. <laughs> you, you, I mean Sorry, I, I think I think the uh, your your completion of the news segment there also coincided with a nice little Google. Uh, yes, um, there, there there was definitely some bandwidth tearing as we were getting through a couple of those news stories. Um, I, I definitely want to backtrack, like take it right back up to the top of the news list, and uh, this ongoing back and forth, the will they, won't they? This is the uh, you know the Sam and Diane or the uh, the moonlighting escapades between Broadcom and Qualcomm. Will will they ever get back together? And once they get together, it's going to wreck all of the romantic tension that we've seen uh, as this drama is played out. Uh, I think that would be the end of the show if they finally did, you know, kind of join up, get get that. This is the show the before whole... Valentine's Day, so I'm trying to make a bad pun here, but uh, I don't know. I mean, it's. I mean, well, it depends. Uh, it's to the whole psyche of what's going on here because as, as we've seen Qualcomm's been uh, shelling out all of the uh, innovations 5G and whatnot and uh, it has been complaining that it has been undervalued because of uh, the failure to include NXP it's a uh, upcoming acquisition it's 37 billion dollar acquisition of uh, a competing company and then there's also a, a few other portfolio things that have been neglected they feel like and this comes about a month away from uh, the annual shareholders meeting where if uh, Broadcom uh, is uh, they have a nomination for its board of directors that they're sending to Qualcomm and uh, it's right now a chance to see if uh, they can uh, pull that off uh, or I'll if Qualcomm well, I'll just be curious to see if, if like this is Qualcomm's future business strategy. Every time they get close to a merger, then they'll just acquire another company and be like, nope, we're worth more now. <laughs> oh, no, we spent like another $12 billion on this other company. Uh, Going to have to raise that that bid price. Like, I wonder how long they could go before Qualcomm just owns everything. And Broadcom's I mean, still like, oh, we'll give you $95 a share, please. <laughs> this is already the biggest, you know, deal ever, pretty much the yeah. biggest uh, acquisition of a company. And uh, but especially as we get towards uh, the if they do happen to agree on a deal, uh, there's certainly all plenty more gears that have to go into motion, especially with regulators uh, across the world. Because this would have more countries to and their um, uh SECs, their security exchange commissions equivalents uh, to look at this uh, deal because uh, currently Broadcom is still headquartered in Singapore. They're trying to yeah. move it to the US. 
but until then, there's national security issues that they have to do uh, deal with, and uh, it's just uh, par for the course in terms of uh, these kinds of uh, of uh, things. But it's it's a mess. They say uh, Broadcom says they would close a deal within 12 months, which for a deal of this scale is kind of uh, laughable. And that's what Qualcomm did uh, last week with a letter of appeal to its shareholders saying that this is a bad deal. Don't vote for their board of directors, vote for our board, uh, board of directors. <laughs> and like, and it, it, like, we can't ever completely escape like the high school popularity votes for student council. Like, no, don't vote for Becky. She smells like glue. I'm the only one that's going to promise you uh, pizza every Tuesday. So uh, if you want to, I have no you know, intentions just, uh, in delivering on that pizza, but I will promise it to you. <laughs> well, I have to and talk about of, the student council and all the principles and all that. Of course, the principle of the matter. Speaking of delivering, uh, what do, what do we think about this cla these class action lawsuits against Google? The Project Fi accusation is actually pretty serious if this turns out to be true with the way that these phones are monitoring data usage, metering what you're paying for and what you're not, that if Google was trying to double dip on Wi-Fi uh, sent content, where because in Project Fi, they, they bill you per gigabyte uh, whenever you're using LTE, whenever you're on a carrier's network. Um, but you're supposed to have, you know, that, that's supposed to be off when you're on Wi-Fi. Obviously, you're paying for Wi-Fi or you're using a business's Wi-Fi that they're paying for. So Google shouldn't be uh, encroaching on that or using that as the metric for how much data you use. Um, if, if we think that this could be a serious allegation, do we think this is why maybe Google did their price protection plan uh, recently, making them a little bit more competitive against normal could carriers be. or... T-Mobile uh, did the same, uh, did like a preemptive kind of thing going on too with the, it's a uh, class action lawsuit. No, it's not a class action. It's just a lawsuit, but a uh, <laughs> single file lawsuit. Uh, in any case, uh, the bill protection thing, I do think is kind of a recoil uh, reaction to it. Um, in terms of the, because the only grounds that I would see Google even remotely trying to argue this on is because of its uh, Wi-Fi assistance, because uh, the, the way it would jump from, you know, LTE to a public Wi-Fi thing automatically mm -hmm. is through the Wi-Fi assistant. That was, wasn't it already a native feature on the uh, Pixel and uh, the even some of the Nexuses, the 5X and 6P? Because uh, that was one of the features that they introduced before Project Fi came on. I'm not sure if this has become sort of a, like a feature that is being marketed as a, exclusive or something. Um, mm -hmm. The only way that I would see it is, uh, you know, if Xfinity Mobile, you know, owned by Comcast, they have all <laughs> right. I mean, we'd have to face some sort of million player entering the market from like a Dish Network's cell phone competitor now is going. But to the, you know, they actually own those hotspots. They actually own the connections right. and whatnot. Whereas the, this is just public access, and they're if they're only doing like charging for the mechanism to which you're connected automatically to a public thing, uh, is kind of ridiculous and. Um, yeah. yeah, it's not very fun. And then also, I, I'll be curious to see if there's any traction on this uh, microphone issue. I've not been impressed with audio hardware on Google phones. And this is coming in from the PN Weekly hashtag Peter Hayton on Twitter. Uh, in relation to Pixel Audio, I have I heard the sound on Jaime Rivera's review of the 2XL, uh, thinking of mics. Has this lawsuit come too late? I, I feel really bad audio, in caps, really bad audio is an issue which should be given more attention. What do you think? And you, I mean, me being the audio nerd on this team, you know, I'm going to say, yes, this all makes it better. But this was one of the primary reasons we returned our original uh, smaller Pixel 2. It was we found out the was, hard way that the mics didn't work when shooting video. And this is already bad because the Pixel shoots video like the iPhone, where it's mono audio only, which is really disappointing for such an expensive device. The problem here was that in the cases of these select customers, because uh, you know, the fault 
has been demonstrated to be a uh, 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 replicable or at least widespread more widespread than uh, a typical kind of one percent issue where it only affects one percent of the population but uh the thing was is that the the soldering to the audio codec was poorly done and therefore we experience uh, some of them experienced crackling uh peaking uh speaker audio and some of them experienced the microphones not working at all as in as in not just for video as in not at all meaning that they mm -hmm. can't act they can't make calls or access i mean who really system? calls on their phone anymore i mean all the kids are doing the whatsapp and and the the pinterest now i'm pretty sure that's how everybody's talking these days exactly no well, yeah we all use bluetooth headphones and whatnot I mean, totally that's, that's like the, and and this in the snapchats i hear that's a uh, that's different than making a phone call so you you would do that instead so yeah i mean and this and it's not just because uh this was an issue that google didn't acknowledge google did acknowledge it but they faffed around with a whole bunch of customers and between multiple rma units and uh just uh having the warranty run out and when they could have gotten a better deal uh, out of this whole mess, it's uh, it, it's uh, that's that's their claim. That's the that's the class action going on there. Um, they're trying to get um, as, as many class members as possible. They're looking at at least a hundred and at least five million dollars in damages uh, going on here. Which I'm sure every Pixel One owner will receive a whopping thirty-seven cents once the. Uh... The, the the lawyers and everything is uh, sorted out and lets the lawyers take their cut. I'd actually be kind of curious if if uh, folks out there, especially folks who have a first generation Pixel, if you guys were affected by any of this, drop us a comment, hit that Twitter, use the PN Weekly hashtag, um, or or also just sort of broader in general, the notion of really premium and premier gadgets and devices. These are coming with ever inflating price tags, and yet we still seem to encounter really obnoxious QA problems, uh, you know, really obnoxious consistency problems. Th these are the things that we're supposedly paying for when we're investing in a nicer gadget. What do you guys think if, if this is actually going to move the needle on the industry or have cell phones just become so commoditized that this is now just what we have to expect for progress, for phones to iterate this quickly? Uh, we'll take the compromise of phones which don't perform as advertised or uh, or inconsistently manufactured. Uh, hit us up. I, I'll be curious to hear your thoughts on this. If we get some good comments, we'll we'll chat them out towards the end of the show. Uh, we definitely need to unpack this T-Mobile story, though, yeah. because this, this is beyond just like you know, oh no, they throttled my YouTube's and made me watch standard definition video. This this actually has some real security implications. So this kind of scam, uh, the port out thing, has been going on for a good while. Uh, I heard uh, in the news some sort of uh, case where uh, AT&T account was uh, compromised. They just they could just uh, go in, not ask vague questions or answer the questions vaguely, or just go like somehow manipulate the the the. Uh, representative on the call, uh, just to, you right. know, hey, that, that's it. And they'd get little pieces of information and eventually they'd wriggle their way into the account and do whatever they please with it. And with uh, a phone number being used for two-factor authentication or for uh, SMS uh, authentication or for whatever, uh, it, it's a key to plenty of accounts. Uh, the account, itself has plenty of uh, information that you can extract from and uh, in the case here with uh, Mr. Carlos Tapang of Washington State apparently uh, his uh, three phones uh, his wife's his daughter's and his own uh, were wiped of data and then uh, afterwards he found out that AT&T had their accounts uh, it took them a little while to get them worked back in but Tapong actually uh, was uh, during the time that his uh, account was compromised, he lost access to his uh, accounts from uh, Omizgo and BitConnect, uh, a couple of cryptocurrencies, but the whole thing amounted to about three Bitcoin. And uh, at the time of uh, the lawsuit, or at the time of the incident, which was November, last November, uh, it was worth about $20,000. 
Yeah. And at its peak around this, uh, Christmas or so, it was worth as much as $55,000. So, uh, he could, I mean, he missed out from all of this just because T Mobile apparently didn't have uh, enough of the security that he needed in order for, you know, to prevent this kind of scam. Recently, right. they've been notifying customers to set up a, a the dedicated port out uh, pin so that they can protect themselves right at that step well, of he, the. Didn't, didn't he actually have that pin set up though? Isn't that was a that... general account access pin? It's gotcha. you know what you use to access the account and do uh, commit to actions. Whereas this this would be right before. Oh, I'm going to switch. All right, we'll need your pin for that. So. Yeah, I, I'm. A... I'll be curious to see what T-Mobile's response here. I, I think the the escalating security concerns on how much we live our lives through mobile accounts, uh, uh, small pocketable computers. This this thing is, you know, like obviously we're going to see an increase in this type of data trafficking, which means that we're going to see an increase in the bad actors out there that want to find novel ways of gaining access, especially when they can they can hard target hit people on individual issues and. You know, it's it's not going to be as scary. <coughs> excuse me, it's not going to be as scary as when there's like an industry wide exploit that can be leveraged very very easily. But I think there's still enough money for taking the amount of time to individually target consumers like this. I'm not entirely sure what T-Mobile can do to make this situation better. How do you safeguard an account data to a point where you really trust that? an outsider can't get in, but you also don't make it ridiculously painful for the consumer to get in or change information or update information. It's like, as soon as you have some kind of point of access, that's, that's a point of failure. And, you know, a company like T-Mobile has a lots of points of access, which means they have lots of points of failure. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, there are different ways where in which the encryption comes in to save your butt. And in this case, the only encryption that you get is, uh, hey, um, what was that? What was my name again? Uh, it, was it? it it's a W. Is it? And there's like this little. <laughs> and they start playing like, um, what was that? Oh, who was the guy? That did uh, was it Crossing Over? That terrible sci-fi show with the uh, with the mystic? Crossing Jordan? No, not Crossing Jordan. Crossing Jordan was an okay show. Um, I think it was crossing <laughs> over, you know, like basically a guy who goes out there and does his Vegas act like, oh, I sense someone in the audience. I'm getting the letter R. Is the, is the R if someone okay, feels yeah, yeah. my yeah. name is That's Robert. Right. And you're like, if you just do that to a T-Mobile employee who's maybe making a buck over minimum wage, like, yeah, you'll you'll probably be able to get into anyone's account. Again, the social engineering. I, you know, we all know this. We all know, like, you watch a movie scene and someone's hacking and they're typing frantically on a keyboard. Way more hacking is 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 more about social engineering and unraveling someone's behavior than it is hacking the hardware, the the you know, and unraveling the encryption on the mainframe. Like, that's not that's not the way more hacking the, is done on a bed with a box of pizza next to you and you're trying to figure out what's going on with uh, this hash and um, then you just give up for the night and uh, sleep on the box of pizza and 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 like like you're super fancy with pizza i was gonna make a, a joke about like pizza rolls you know <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah that that would be better a scattering of like three quarter eaten pizza rolls because he really just hates that last little crunchy crust bite he can't stand it so he leaves that on the side he's watching his carb intake but all the rest he really wants to like get that gooey center out of every single totinos that he can we are it's not, really tricky we are because once you first microwave them man those things are molten like that is lava in your mouth right there but you know he needs his he needs his hacker fuel along with his Mountain Dew Code Red. And that's exactly not the image I think we should be trying to run for hackers because now they're going to wreck my ass. We are not sponsored by Totino's, nor are we sponsored by Mountain Dew Code Red. Or just, hackers. Just we're not sure. sponsored by hackers. So, uh, we but do we have will this take a Ren break. Uh, oh, real quick. We do have yeah, one sure, comment here. Uh, um, from Renato Laporte, PN Weekly. These are two tweets coming in. How can number porting be so easy? Have you either... Here, you either need physical access to the SIM to provide the SIM number, or you need to confirm with an SMS code. Uh, further, your old provider will notify you by mail and SMS, and the whole process takes at least 11 days. So if asked 
So if ask a number porting, I'll need to wait at least 11 days. I'm on prepaid or 30 days when on contract. And in the meanwhile, I get notified by the old and new provider of the day and time that the number porting will happen. Now, that's that's because I think you're going through those individual points of contact. If you can if you can re replace someone's user data, like if you can impersonate that person and you can switch over some of that communication like, oh, and hey, send my new bill to this address or you know, like, and you send like some specious address and it's not really a, the right thing. If you can kind of wedge yourself in there, I, I bet it wouldn't be too hard to intercept some of that communication and verification process. Yeah, my, my specious address would be uh, the address of the transformer that's outside uh, the house over here. So yeah, I'd, 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 I'd probably... I don't remember what it is now. Wow, that's that's a terrible. I was going to say I'd probably do something like uh, Evergreen Terrace from The Simpsons. Evergreen like, Terrace. Uh, who lived there? Yeah, in, in Springfield. No, yeah, no, but but who 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 lived there? Because the, it's Simpsons. Uh, I just forget forget no, what I, the street okay. is. It's something 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 Evergreen Terrace. That's <laughs> neither. I would I would be thinking it would be uh, one of the other. You know, it would be Smithers, but then no wait. I don't know. I mean, watch right across Simpsons the street from Gerald Ford, and then Gerald Ford just disappeared and was never heard from again in the Simpsons universe. But that's that's all I'm saying. So. Well, I, I think I could do with some steamed hams uh, right about now. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll take a thirty second break, and uh, we'll give I'm, our. Small... I'm going to go watch the Aurora Borealis in in my kitchen while <laughs> listen to this amazing cut of audio from this. Yes, yeah. you, you go do that. Don't know where to begin? Check out the Google Cloud Platform Weekly Podcast, where Google developer advocates Melanie Warwick and Mark Mandel answer questions, get in the weeds, and talk to GCP teams, customers, and partners about best practices, from security to machine learning and more. Hear from technologists all across Google about trends and cool things happening with our technology. Click to learn more and subscribe to the podcast at g.co slash GCP podcast. And we are back and uh, ready to do some little, little more news uh, as we go along on this show here. Uh, certainly, yeah, we've got some other topics to discuss for Apple as uh, it uh, goes on in terms of its uh, iPhone battery replacement program for the six all the way through the seven with the SE included, and uh, it has reported to Congress to a uh, Senate subcommittee on uh, its progress, saying that demand has been very strong, and that uh, one of the members of the, actually the chairman, the Repu uh, Republican John Thune of North Dakota said that uh, Apple may be considering giving rebates out to those who had already gotten an out of warranty battery replacement for $79, and they could be giving $50 rebates uh, to them uh, to reflect uh, the current price, the subsidized price of $29. So that might be interesting to uh, look to. In the meantime, we've got word from Amazon that it is now selling uh, Amazon Prime exclusive phones, Android phones uh, that used to have lock screen ads and uh, wallpapers compromised with uh, promotions. Nowadays, they're not doing that anymore. Uh, they are charging twenty dollars more, but there's still it's still a very hefty discount uh, from the original price. And instead, you'll you'll just uh, have to deal with uh, Amazon apps, uh, you know, more of those services coming in uh, baked into your uh, phone. So less intrusive, but uh, the reason why they said they're doing this is because of uh, facial recognition that hmm. their each their lock screen ads would preclude those features from working. So uh, that sort of makes sense right there. Carl Pei has taken down uh, some rumors as he is wont to do sometimes. He has been a pretty vocal person, but especially when it comes to rumors about his company making uh, phones, the OnePlus X2. That's not a real thing. It's fake news. We should be combating it with uh, <laughs> civility. In the, like, I don't know. But uh, it would be a sequel to the mid-range phone of 2015 that followed on from the OnePlus 2. And uh, it was a one-time only thing at $249. It was a pretty cool thing, too, uh, as we have reviewed it with the ceramic back and uh, whatnot. But sadly, it doesn't seem like uh, we're going to get that. 
Let's talk about uh, something else here. How about LG? The company has said that uh, it uh, it will be leaving the Chinese market for smartphones. Apparently, a reporter was able to go up to their offices in Beijing, and a staffer just said that. So uh, it's not surprising, <laughs> even though less than... It was a very anticlimactic story there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it was, but, you know, that's what they said. Uh, it's not surprising, <laughs> given the less than 1%, less than 0.1% market share that they have uh, in their troubles trying to compete on price, where everyone is competing on price, including the domestic players. So uh, they're they're just looking their wounds at this point. And uh, one of the other industries that is uh, looking their wounds is uh, the the fabricators of CDs, DVDs, those kinds of things. Because Best Buy has announced, or uh, reportedly announced, uh, this is uh, through Billboard here, that they are dropping CD uh, inventory from July 1st, and that Target wow. is also uh, looking towards moving to a consignment model where uh, the onus is on the suppliers to uh, uh, take care of the inventory and whatnot, and they would only pay the suppliers uh, per sale. Uh, so this is a this is a, one of the last gasps of air that uh, the CD will have in our retail space for now, especially as vinyl comes up and streaming dominates the space. Yeah. So, um, well, I definitely uh, want to talk about that. We should we should probably save that though. Uh, what? Excuse me. Uh, uh, my my uh, beef jerky snack during the ad break is coming back to make itself heard during our podcast. Um, I want to get back to the Apple uh, story because one of the things it's just sort of a throwaway comment that a lot of news outlets are putting out there is that Apple is already facing fifty class action lawsuits. Uh, di- uh, directly related to the batter- battery throttling uh, situation. I really don't feel that this story is resonating with general consumers. I think it's something that uh, tech fans have been talking about a lot, but it doesn't seem to have significantly impacted, disrupted, or even just cracked into the general mind share on uh, sort of the general pop- populace. I uh, with with some of these stories like consumer or about us or about Apple or what? Well, but that's kind of what I'm trying to unravel is like, at what point do we care? This kind of goes back to that question that I threw out there about the the perception of the smartphone market and the commoditization of the smartphone. And now we all just sort of have accepted certain kinds of lobster potting compromises that seem to get worse over time, not better. Uh, But, you know, we're still buying these things and we're still supporting certain companies because they're our team. Um, I'm wondering what it would if if Apple goes through this process of offering up rebates, is it's probably just going to be some janky little press release on the back pages of the Apple website where someone would have to know about it through some other means, look it up, search for it, dig through the website, fill out some really obnoxious paperwork, serial numbers, date of purchase, proof of purchase, and then try and get some kind of receipt back from when they got the battery replacement in the first place, which no one's going to do or very few people are going to do for the $50 that they stand to potentially get back from Apple. It just seems like, it seems like kind of a non gesture from Apple's perspective. I think uh, back when Apple was announcing their profits or the, no, not profits, um, the jobs, 20,000 new jobs and the, because of the tax cuts, uh, like there was some characterization, maybe in the ABC news interview, uh, or something, uh, some something like that. But Tim Kolk, uh, or maybe one of the analysts that they had on, was saying that this was uh, the battery replacement program was kind of a, a, a olive branch or, or like some something gracious on Apple's part <laughs> <laughs> that, that 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 they were offering. It wasn't because you know this was um, you know a thing that could have damaged. Uh, or maybe is damaging their brand, is damaging sales in some respects. So, well, I, I I seriously doubt it is, especially just because when we look at traditional media, um, I had to reach out to my contact at Fox, and he, the producer I work with thought it was hilarious. But when this story was first reported, and it was only reported sort of in the initial batch of disclosure that came out, 
uh one of the uh one of the actual like hard hitting investigative uh journalists at Fox 11 she had you could tell she had very little understanding of what was going on and just kept talking about how Apple was throttling the battery and just kept repeating that phrase over and over and over again like you know they're slowing down the battery they're throttling the battery a lot of people are going to be upset about that no one wants their battery to be throttled no one wants their battery slowed down <laughs> It's That's like it's like the problem is no. you, you, you had one job. <laughs> it's like it's like saying they're slowing down the water and like like the water is being slowed down so it, that it won't complete, it was completely nonsensical. That was the level of traditional media coverage that we got in Southern California. I know some other outlets probably handled it better. Local news people, there were probably some people who handled it better. Some people who didn't talk about it at all because it's geeky stuff. Um, but it, yeah, that was emblematic of one of the nation's largest media markets. And that's how they were talking about this issue. You know, any consumer who saw that and you're like, oh yeah, my battery is kind of slower. It used to charge really fast. You know, like, like that's not, that wasn't what the problem was. And, and so knowing that there's, a woefully undereducated base of consumers out there. Um, and and to, to their credit, well, it's that they, they want a product that's going to be easy to use and that just sort of fits into their lifestyle and they don't have to think about managing that product too often. They don't even want to think about the reason. Yeah, they, it's like, oh, my battery's slow. I don't care as long as you fix it and make sure that it's uh, whatever's slow is fast again. Well, and then, but it's also like this, I, I feel like, if Apple is is in earnest trying to repair some of the ill will that this has caused, they need to be proactive in reaching out to consumers. You've got all of the records of customers who shopped through Genius stores and got, excuse me, got products and got batteries replaced. I would want to see, at, at, you know, like, I, I think it would be probably too grand a, a gesture of Apple right now. Because they're not a magnanimous company. They're a corporation that exists to uh, create as much value for shareholders as they can. Um, what I would want to see them do is contact all of those customers that supplied email addresses. If not that, then some sort of public posting on a major page of the Apple website. I, I would want to see them publicly disclose, this was the problem. This was our communication. We're owning it. And this is how we're going to fix the problem. I'm really not impressed so far with the little dance we're doing with, oh no, this was for the consumer benefit because it really does need to be disclosed at some point that there is no expectation of your multi hundred two thousand dollar product being able to last more than a year and not face severe instability, shutdowns, slowdowns without wrecking the performance of the device that needs mm -hmm. to be front and center for every discussion we have about apple now they put in the bare minimum battery to last you the day when the phone is brand new and they haven't addressed this publicly to any great degree while still maintaining this public image of this company and this brand being you know so user friendly so consumer friendly so so easy to use it just works they get so much goodwill from the the carryover days of apple's brand reputation that this should be a bigger deal in the general populace i want to move to australia not because telus or uh, not telus telstra or optus are any good but because of the australian consumer law which says that you you know if they're you're the consumer's entitled to a refund if uh, the product doesn't last for a typical you know for a typical life cycle uh and you know they base it off of industry figures of um but like this is you know there's a lot of there are a lot more protective uh, aspects to it so that you know consumers aren't fobbed off by the manufacturer or the store the seller like there's and we wouldn't be, we wouldn't have to deal with all this yeah I, I we definitely need to change some part of this conversation i think one of the things that's been most frustrating is uh the geek side of this has been devalued what with tech being so prolific in the consumer space and becoming more of a lifestyle conversation uh to be fair geeks are intolerably frustrating to converse with 
Um, <laughs> you know, like, uh, we're, we're not always the easiest people to, to engage with, uh, but this is precisely why we need to be leading these kinds of conversations and making sure that we're being inclusive, really trying to draw people in and, and not engaging in as much schadenfreude over Apple's brand reputation as we probably want to be more trying to handle the concern for our friends and family who are getting a raw deal. And, and, yeah. and approaching that is going to be really sensitive because you have that backfire effect. You know, someone has a, sort of a dogmatic relationship with a brand and geeks are certainly guilty of this, too. Um, but someone has that dogmatic relationship with a brand. They're going to hear information that runs counter to their assertions. Even if it's good evidence, they're going to actually recoil farther away from that new information than, uh, than if you can join the conversation in a way that's less confrontational. Speaking of uh, geeks' dogmatic relationship with uh, consumer brand, what Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to skip Amazon and go to OnePlus because OnePlus, I think, is the perfect I, 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 of I, a geek brand. I want to dogmatically segue, follow the brand regardless of whatever evidence that brand is likely to show them. You're right. Let's talk about Amazon first, though. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I wanted to. That was the part of the joke I wanted to put <laughs> uh, pull off there. But um, I'm happy. I'm certainly happy that we'll, we're seeing fewer ads, or at least you know not having to deal with them as uh, obtrusively as they used to be uh, for what hundred dollars less or like twenty percent off the price of a of a usual phone. It's just going to be a little bit more uh, smoother. We'll actually be able to use a feature. That was intended by the OEM on the phone. Like it's going to be great. Gasp! <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, mean, I think this is this is a really good look for Amazon right now because this is uh, Amazon as an organization is going to face some some optics problems coming up soon. Jeff Bezos being so ridiculously wealthy and valuable in terms of the company stock and his own earnings, while also looking at stores that are probably going to start laying off cashiers for automated Amazon systems to do checkout. The, the whole job apocalypse is going to be you know, fueled in part by Amazon innovation. And we also as a society need to come to grips with how do we value labor and human dignity when it's it shouldn't necessarily always be just affixed to a straight dollar amount that you can generate through your labor or through your. Uh, I mean, there is no dignity in going to an Amazon Go store. Have you seen what we look like in those cameras, where where we're kind of dancing around and looking at objects and determining the value of them and. I, I, I can't say that I have jewels. Um, <laughs> I'm unfamiliar with the uh, dancing in an Amazon Go store. Uh, so, but but this 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 is a step that I actually do want to say thumbs up because I think we're starting to get the early indications that the next phase of online services can't be built in just a dumb advertising model anymore. I don't think that's going to be the future of monetizing content. I think YouTube is learning this lesson the hard way and is pissing off a humongous part, uh, a chunk of their user base in the process. Uh, Amazon is probably looking at these metrics and saying, you know, for what ad revenue we might engage with or what services people might sign up for, if we charge $20 more for the phone, we're going to balance that out as opposed to keeping people signed up on Amazon Prime. That Amazon Prime is the bigger draw for Amazon than making sure someone is constantly aware of ads in their general sphere well, of influence. Frankly speaking, I mean, we're talking about Prime exclusive phones. They were available only, they are available, excuse me, only to those who have an Amazon Prime subscription. Right. Those that $99 a year that you pay. And Amazon is encouraging you to buy more products that, that generate more revenue than just an a la carte service, which you already have access to. Prime music, prime movies, like you can, it's like all they've done for you is just make the app appear on the thing automatically, as opposed to you having to download it. And, but that's where most of the revenue has come from. And with that out of the way, their largest uh, revenue generator for something that's arguably kind of like 
human pro human uh, <laughs> you can say that um i'm wondering where they might be able to squeeze in another kind of uh, thing that might be able to encourage sales or prod them along well but that's and and i think that that goes hand in hand with this this change in philosophy you weren't getting you you weren't getting the ad impact on someone who was already a prime subscriber by hijacking their their lock screen that wasn't the big value ad keeping them in the prime ecosystem is way better from a monetary standpoint than potentially losing someone to a competing product or a competing service. And so now we've got these offers on phones, which generally have very, very competitive pricing. Like looking at the LG G6 Plus on Amazon Prime, that's a that's a that's a decent deal for a, a reasonably powerful phone, uh, right in that mid-ranger territory against other competitors. Like there is. A, a, an idea there that that works really well. So you get them to buy that phone, which comes preloaded with Amazon services. This to me speaks of a future tactic that Microsoft is probably going to be engaging in. Don't try and fight Android. Instead, make Android full of Microsoft services. So you sell you you have that licensing deal with Samsung. Samsungs are being sold in Microsoft stores and come preloaded with Microsoft services. You know, this is the one part of Microsoft that is like absolutely dominating still and still finding growth at the same time is keeping people invested in the Microsoft software ecosystem. Don't try and fight a hardware war you can't battle. You can't win. So that this this I think is going to be a really interesting take on the next gen of services is what can Google do to provide a value add for a service like YouTube? You know, you, you want to keep people invested, watching content, streaming content, and trying to monetize that has proven an uphill battle and even more difficult uh, proposition in this era of super popular YouTube channels engaging in abject uh, douchebaggery. You know, like you're going to scare off advertisers. Well, that's Google's bread and butter, getting people to pay for ads. But how do you leverage that against people who don't watch ads? And Facebook is trying to figure this out, too. At the same time saying like, oh, no, buy an ad so that all of you people will know about your product. But ads couldn't possibly affect political campaigns. Uh, ads aren't effective for, for that. <laughs> you know? Like, you know, every single company that built their service on cool, put it out for free and is now trying to find a way to monetize. It, we're going to see radically decreasing uh, benefits to making consumers interact with advertising to try and fund your cool service. <sighs> All right. Um, you, you talked about a war that you can't win. Is that right? So I've met Carl pay in real life a couple of times. He seems very determined. Did you go to war with Carl pay it. again? Is that, is that what we're getting at? No, Are you? No, I, I'm not talking it? about, I'm talking, no, 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 when it comes to Twitter, when it comes to social media, he is like a wall. You can't get things, you know, across, you know, blast. You can't blast things through him without uh, talk. Okay, so uh, there have been rumors about a OnePlus X two, as I've talked about, it'd be a mid range sequel to the OnePlus X, and uh, there there were like spec rumors about the Snapdragon eight thirty five. As I see, I haven't looked into the. Uh, source rumor material, uh, but what got my attention was Carl Pay's retweet of the story, and then he just says nope, and then he goes on to crusade about fake news is a huge threat to human civilization. Let's all do our part in stopping it. And the thread goes on, uh, and, you know, claims about him denying the One Plus Three T before it was launched or something like that. Um, maybe it could have been. Uh, talk about the one plus three s but letters <laughs> branding uh hashtag fake news hashtag clickbait uh blah 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 please make a compact five inch two by one handset uh one plus device sizes are getting out of hand carl pay grow bigger hands so i mean he's a he's a he's a force that to be guy. reckoned with just that talking. joker I, you know, so, so here's the thing. I mean, getting into the, to the meat of the rumor, I really hope that OnePlus does not try another X experiment. 
I think you already have a messaging problem with the no compromises, never settling device that's supposed to come in at a much lower price point. You you can't you can't extend that conversation back down into a phone that's purposely designed to have compromises to meet certain price tiers. Um, this this is this it didn't work for the X and and I know the other people were complaining like oh well the X never got nougat and like maybe if it got if you'd gotten those software updates that was out of OnePlus's control. I don't know that any Qualcomm 801 series phones got got updates to nougat because of issues with kernels and Google and programmers and developers. Um, but this is where the company needs to focus. They need to kind of keep a very clean brand message going, especially if they're trying to pivot mainstream and a one device strategy that sort of lands smack dab in the middle of the smartphone market marketplace price is I think the safest way for them to go. I think if they diversify and they try and do too much, then they're probably going to make everyone unhappy, not Oh well, we'll have products to you know entice more customers. I don't think those those products will be as well built or as well supported. I don't even think that T should like exist. It should be just one device. If you have to wait until November to launch it, then go ahead. But I kind of like that as an idea. I don't think they're executing that idea very well is because they don't have multiple phone lines and they, they're trying, again, remember a lot of this is that emotional branding, right? They're trying to get you to have an emotional relationship with the company because, I mean, all, all things being equal, there are numerous solutions for having a smartphone today. Whatever draws you in is likely going to be an emotional response first, and then you'll go back and rationally justify why you want to do business with that company. I think there's something really cool about the conversation of them saying tech, iterates and cycles quickly. And so we are going to put out two phones a year, but they're going to be the same phone. It's just there's always going to be a refresh. So if you're at this point of the year, if you jump in now, you're, you'll be getting the best tech that we can get our hands on. Because that's going to change very rapidly over a period of about six months, we're going to give it a refresh coming in here. So that way you never really feel like your phone is like three years out of date. It's Depending on when you get in and depending on when you decide to rebuy, buy in for a new phone, you know that you'll be pretty close to whatever's bleeding edge at that time. I think the problem is, is they're trying to operate with secrecy as if these are so such new and different devices that are coming out. The, the 5, the 5T, oh, it's fresh, it's new, it's exciting, that it's going to make people who buy in at the first half of the year feel like, like they're getting the bad device. That's that, that to me is just a, a problem of brand perception. I think if they were more proactive and more forthright in the conversation, the, con the customers would know, like, I'm getting the best possible device that one could buy today. Because if you wait, you can always get a better device. It doesn't matter what manufacturer. You wait six months, better phones will come out. You know, there is there is a qualitative difference in like Galaxy S8 to Galaxy Note 8. And, you know, part of that is just getting a newer version of Android and better understanding of how to optimize for the hardware that Samsung built. So I think if OnePlus could join the conversation that way, there'd be a lot less ire over these, uh, you know, these refreshes every six months. If, especially if it wants to be a mainstream brand. Totally. And that decides yeah, consumers to... Consumers aren't, aren't going to follow that. Aren't, consumers aren't going to piece that together on their own. You're going to have to spoon feed general consumers and no way carriers are going to want to support those kinds of SKUs. They're going to want the one OnePlus phone that they can put up in a display case. They're not going to want to jump through these types of branding shenanigans unless OnePlus already comes with a growing user base that are demanding that phone. <sighs> All right, let's uh, get to our in memoriam parts. I'm not sure if that, <laughs> that's what we want to call it. Um, but yeah, um, so... Best Buy, Target, they're not playing around with CDs anymore. Uh, digital downloads are even going down the drain, and there have been rumors about iTunes, uh, that music store, going away, although Apple's denied it. it's uh, You can tell that physical media, especially the LaserDisc, no, that's not right, <laughs> the compact disc, that's laser, laser etched and can store up to 4.7 gigabytes of media on it. 
I think that's, a, that's for a DVD or something like that. That's for a, it's not for a CD, dude. <laughs> CD was seven fifty megabytes. Is that seven fifty megabytes? Mm. And he had those write speeds that I never really understood. Like, what what was eight times or six? That was times, a big right? deal back in the day. I remember when I got my first CD burner and uh, I splurged on the the faster. It was I think it was an eight speed CD burner. You actually had to make sure the media was compatible because if you tried to to burn too fast, it would like it would like corrupt the data in the burn when it would fail, and you'd have to throw out one of these preciously expensive uh, shiny reflective. Uh, you know, you know coasters <laughs> like, like what, know. what are cds made out of because like beyond the chrome and varnish i don't know uh like what the medium actually is i mean it's it's a uh, it's plastic with um with a light reflective substance now cds that were that were finished for um for for, for distribution in music the uh, the zeros and ones are on a medium that is that is pretty well permanent, like a, a, a metal substrate, I believe. The uh, CD burner, I believe, actually had an ink like layer that the laser would then disrupt the patterns in the ink to create the uh, zeros and ones. I'm grossly oversimplifying the technology of the CD because it is it is a little bit more complicated than that. But that's essentially, I like think, how level. totally. And and I'm and it's not like there's ink in a CD. I just mean it's 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 sort of like a, you know, like like a hole punch like process. And so it, it is a different material than what a finished music CD uh, resembled. But yeah, I, I I think it's kind of interesting. There there is something so organic and tactile. Like I need to go and get a new turntable. My turntable actually died last year. Um, and it was a cheap turntable, so it wasn't like I was super sad. But there's something so so tactile and so organic about the needle drop on vinyl when you want to listen. You you want to sit down and you want to listen to music, not just have music soundtracking another activity. Like I'm not going to put on a record to go and then work out. Um, that that it, it's hilarious. That has well eclipsed the the convenience of the CD. Like you don't want the CD for that organic listening experience. Um, that's way less convenient than just listening to MP3s. I'll be curious to see if in this digital space, since people don't seem to be as concerned about owning digital files of their music as much as streaming, if we'll ever get back to some idea of having an archival quality digital file that people own. Like if you really love this album and you want to save the absolute best, highest quality version of it, there aren't marketplaces that that really fully take advantage of the audio playing capabilities on modern mobile hardware, let alone, you know, like high end stereo equipment still seems kind of focused more on the enthusiast sector of people who listen to vinyl. Yeah. What do you think about that anyways? Because like in the same breath of news that we got where Best Buy is saying that they're dropping their CD stock on July 1st, they're apparently going to keep on selling records with turntables for the next couple of years. Well, a major problem with with digital, like hardware digital was we never got that marketing quality bump. Mm. Uh, you know, like we went from DVDs to Blu-rays, uh, I mean, Laserdisc to DVD to Blu-ray, uh, especially moving from VHS to DVD. That was a huge jump. Um, CDs stayed at sort of a, a basic red book 1644 one you know like that 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 never really improved we had sacd and dvda that fought a format war that no one cared about when again if you hadn't had that format war holding back the innovation of a higher quality standard you could have been marketing the crap out of that to people who fancy themselves audio files whether or not you believe that there's any benefit to 24-bit audio i do believe there is a benefit to archival quality like where you take that 24 bit file and you 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 know you make a flack out of it or you make a, a high quality mp3 out of it for convenience but then you always have that amazing source file to go back to and as the industry improves or there are better audio playing capabilities in phones or in media players or bluetooth headsets maybe someday become super great um you can always go back to the source to make whatever new format the industry might be utilizing mqa looks like that might be uh, another potential uh, a benefit mm -hmm. for super high quality but low impact, like a low uh, low streaming. That that compression seems like it's going to be a, a boon for the industry. 
So they, they completely missed out on iterating. You know, how do you get someone to rebuy a CD? It sounds pretty much good enough. Um, so you needed to make that emotional argument again. I'm like uh, everything about this week. It's the week before Valentine's Day. It's all about it. The emotions, the feelers uh, you needed to make that you know, you needed to make someone feel like their CD wasn't good enough. Just like going from DVD to Blu-ray. You did see some quality, some some video quality benefits that HD. Ooh, that's super fancy. Um, but for a lot of folks out there, especially before HD TVs were as commonplace, we're buying Blu-rays like on the future of what what kind of TV they might own after their current, you know, standard definition TV. Man, you talk about SVCD versus DVD. I only remember D, uh, HD DVD and uh, Blu-ray. Like that that yeah. was the big fight of my time, so. <sighs> yeah, so, so we had we had these formats and they were better copy protected. I mean, the music industry wanted a, a more locked up format. You couldn't just rip them like you could CDs, although that would have changed if they had found any any kind of traction. And uh, I, you know, I really wanted to like experiments like uh, um, what was that? Was it a uh, Ponyo? Onyo? What was that uh, weird, funky Ankyo? yellow? Yeah, not Ankyo. <laughs> I, I can't remember. It was uh, I think it was was it Neil Diamond? <laughs> Puyo? I don't know. Uh, right. I'm yeah. gonna look this up. This is terrible podcasting, but I'm actually going to look for yeah, player. Yo, Neil Diamond Yo. Uh was it like a Marshall no, thing or like it? Pono. No, it was it was it was Pono. Um, Pono. I was, I was, oh, yeah, that's I was right. completely wrong, but I was pretty close. Um yeah, so I mean that never materialized. Titles, super high quality audio doesn't seem to be much of a draw to anyone. But there is something, and it's probably mostly psychosomatic. But I pulled some, there are some sample sites that have like uh, really high quality MQA rips of like orchestral music. And yeah. I plugged in, I, it's not like I own super, super expensive audiophile headphones. I, I mean, right now, my go to open back headphones are just a pair of Sennheiser 599s, which are expensive, but they're not like, you know, like Shure's $3,000 electrostatic earbuds or anything like that. Um, but I'll, I'll plug those 599s into an LG V30 and fire up this MQA track. And it feels different than anything else that I've listened to from like MP3s and decent earbuds. Like it expands on the audio and the music in a way that just feels so much nicer. Again, could be all in my brain just because I know what I'm doing and I know what I like. And so I, I might just be, you know, kind of, you know, uh, circle jerking myself. you're just visualizing the, the, how many ones and zeros are coming in through each medium. Like, yeah, well, the, but that's, the but that's what's exciting about MQA is because MQA is, is giving us like audio, audio quality that scientifically resides in like the 32 bit audio space, but in a, in a, in a format that it would be much easier to stream. Uh, like what title was trying to do with with a 24 bit uh 24 bit masters uh to to download onto people's devices um mqa could give us you know spotify super high quality you know anyone who who fancies themselves that audiophile grade listener or ears that can really discern these types of nuances though that's probably not true um <laughs> the you know the the color and dynamic range and spatial separation and all these things that we say we care about when we were trying to be discerning music listeners mqa could deliver at a much smaller file size to make the the streaming the bandwidth requirements much lower and that could be really exciting now if anyone can explain to me the concept of computing via tape cassettes uh that would be <laughs> appreciated thanks I, I can't really help you with that. I, I only had five and a quarter floppies. I never had a tape deck. I always wanted never to had that a they were really good. a Commodore. You never no. had a... I, I went straight to DOS. I was on an 8088, man. And and yeah. we, we splurged for not only dual floppy drives, but dual floppy drives and a hard drive. We had Ooh. kilobytes of built-in storage, brah. You don't even know. It was lit. 200... 56 kilobytes man <laughs> i mean who could store i mean that's that's like that's like a quarter of the library of congress if you have no pictures <laughs> <laughs> uh, man but I, they're probably not even 
trying to remember all the Wikipedia like archives. Like you could archive up the whole of Wikipedia and you just stuff it into a little USB disk and uh, go away. And then sometimes, you know, if you need if you need your Wikipedia, you can just uh, hey, I'll just pull this up. I'll just plug it into my laptop. Oh hey, look at this. Now it's in a completely uh, not friendly to use format, but I can just control F the terms that I need. Right. <laughs> well, and uh, we do have a tweet here from Renata Laporte. Uh, hashtag PN Wiki. Hashtag PN Weekly. <laughs> PN Wikipedia. <laughs> Wiki fee. Uh, Twenty-four bit vinyl rips are the best. I wished this was a thing you could legally buy instead of having to look on on the bays, um, on the uh, whatever torrent site or file transferring site you might use. I, I I've been sort of creating and collecting my own. I've got a Radiohead rip that. Again, it's a little noisier because my turntable wasn't super great, but it's warm and it's fat and it's really well mixed. And Radiohead took the time to deliver a great vinyl transfer because you can't mix for vinyl like you can for for digital. Like you can't you can't overload the bass or you can't overly compress the audio because you know you'll just punch through the sidewall of the record. Like it's it's a really unique listening listening experience and i i cut my vinyl rip i did it 2496 and then i of course i dan sampled it to mp3 so i could easily store it on on my phones at the time um but i'll i can always go back to that 24 bit rip and that was the very first time i dropped the needle on that record i i captured the the exact first listen in its most pristine format because every time you listen to a record it degrades slightly and so, you know, yeah. I've got that 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 very first needle drop captured, you know, that that's an experience. I, I don't know how to properly convey that if you're not really into music or you're not really into this kind of stuff like that's special. <laughs> it feels that's special. Of, and I like music feeling special again, not just being completely disposable. Speaking of, uh, I want to see if we can like do experimental track where you just you know have the bass all the way up, and then it, the, you can have all the the freaking needle skip all the way down to the end of the track like that. Oh. That'd be <laughs> oh, so gross. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could. It would be a really ex expensive experiment that we know will end in abject failure. Uh, Very we good. We could do it. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I mean, something you me. Let's go. Let's uh. I, whenever I head to LA, uh, we'll rent out a studio, and then we'll be able to get our Strandberg out. And, uh, and well, yeah, and we'll it. have to do. We'll have to record everything on like classic vintage ribbon mics, and then on like four track tape machines. No, the uh, only like way we, we do it is through a five pound, a British five pound note. Like we take the plastic. That that has been done. Okay, that has I been am, done. I'm it, unaware it, it, of this. I will have to look that cone, up. Cone up a five pound note, and then uh, then you can actually play it to the. You can actually put it down on a track. It's amazing. Well, but all of that notwithstanding, CDs dying. There's something that makes. There's some idea in the back of my head that makes me feel I should be sad about this, but I'm really not. Like, <laughs> as a physical medium, I wanted to see it evolve, and it never did. Uh, just like we got dvd and then blu-ray and then hd and then quad hd um or i mean uh, yeah. ultra hd so we we never got that same uh that same uh, like uh arms race in in audio to to really try and improve the consumer experience so it's fine it can go away that's safe to argue that it never will so uh good riddance Good riddance. And uh, I, we don't need that much disposable plastic in our lives anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we should probably, speaking of disposable plastic and things that are much better when you stream them, uh, we should probably wrap up the show with one more uh, one more sneak from uh, our sponsor this week because they're not making you buy CDs to listen to their awesome content. No. In fact, uh, we're going to talk about them at the end of the show, like afterwards, like after oh, I thought we were going to do I thought we were going to do that just before the uh, the the wrap up Inside Maybe. baseball people. End roll is, is like literally end of the end roll. So, uh, <laughs> I misread our sheet on how this show is going to go. So, folks, uh, there you have it. Another episode of the Pocket Now Weekly has come and gone. Yeah, I think we over. did a pretty good job trying to survive that thing. 
I think so. No, I think I think it worked out really well. Uh, and not only did it work out well for our show, but if you want to continue uh, conversing on these topics, you can hit us up on uh, the Twitters where Jules is at Point Jules and I'm humbly at some gadget guy. Pocket Now is around the web, pretty much anywhere you can find cool tech media journalism. But of course, you'll want to check out our home site, pocketnow.com and es.pocketnow.com for Spanish speakers. The shows like this cannot exist without your support, sharing the weekly with your friends who love mobile technology and by dropping reviews on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and wherever podcast reviews can be left. And once again, we do want to thank this week's sponsor. You can check out Google Cloud Platform Podcast. Definitely give their show a listen, a listen if you're into that kind of IT and tech. But ultimately, there wouldn't be a show if it weren't for our listeners and subscribers who have kept us on the air since 2012. The Pocket Now Weekly will be back next week with all kinds of delicious technology goodness. So make sure you tune back in. Looking to move to the cloud? Check out the Google Cloud Platform Weekly Podcast, where Google developer advocates answer questions, get in the weeds, and talk to experts, customers, and partners about GCP. Click to learn more and subscribe to the podcast at g.co slash gcppodcast.